As soon as the doors open to Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and Baptists from Cleveland, many Christians become very e uneasy, saying that then Jesus doesn't matter anymore, the cross is irrelevant, it doesn't matter what you believe, and so forth. Basically, what I have been saying, he's saying, well, if you don't believe the door is open, that is not what we're saying. The door is open to all peoples, everywhere, regardless of background, but there is only one way. That is Jesus Christ, belief in Him, and knowing Him is eternal life. That's all we're saying. If you don't believe in Him by being born from above, receive His nature, and get to know Him on this earth, that's it. Now, of course, there are exceptions. I mean, you hear of people that are on their deathbeds and they accept Jesus. Yes, they're going to heaven. Uh, the uh, thief that was on the cross, he didn't have time to get to know Jesus after he was born again. And he didn't go through a prayer. I think we get too tied up in the, this salvation prayer that you must pray. He basically confessed his belief by saying, when you enter your kingdom, please remember me. That was his confession of faith, that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, So we don't want to get caught up in semantics either. He says, not true. Absolutely, unequivocally, unalterably not true. What Jesus does declare is that he and he alone is saving everybody. He will save everyone who accepts him. Okay, And then he leaves the door way, way open. No, he doesn't. In fact, he says, narrow is the way. Narrow is the gate. Okay, Creating all sorts of possibilities. He is as narrow as himself and as wide as the universe. Don't even know what that means. He is as exclusive as himself and as inclusive as containing every single particle of creation. Again, not sure. When people use the word Jesus, then it's important for us to ask who they're talking about. I would really like to know which Jesus Rob Bell is talking about. Are they referring to a token of tribal membership, a tame domesticated Jesus who waves the flag and promotes whatever values they've decided their nation needs to return to? Now let's get into politics. Are they referring to the supposed source of the imperial impulse of their group, which wants to conquer other groups in the name of Jesus? Hopefully not. Are they referring to the logo or slogan of their political, economic, or military system through which they sanctify their greed and lust for power? Or are they referring to the very life source of the universe? Uh, this life source is a person who has walked among us and continues to sustain everything with his love and power and grace and energy. Jesus is both near and intimate and personal and big and wide and transcendent. I do like that statement. One of the many things people in a church do then is name, honor, and orient, orient themselves around this mystery. A church is a community of people who enact specific rituals and create specific experiences to keep this word alive in their hearts. A gathering of believers who help provide language and symbols and experiences for this mystery. When we baptize, we lower people into the water and then bring them back up out of the water. The water signifies death. Being raised up out of it signifies life. Lowered like Christ in his death, raised like Christ in his life. When we take the Eucharist or communion, we dip bread into a cup, enacting and remembering Jesus' gift of himself. His body, his blood, for the life of the world, our bodies, our lives, for the life of the world. So, sounds good. These rituals are true for us because they're true for everybody. They unite us because they unite everybody. No, they are not true for everybody. Water baptism means nothing to someone who does not know the entire story of Jesus becoming man, dying, and being raised from the dead so that we can be free from our sins. And communion doesn't mean anything. In fact, we just had, she's um, not a new believer, but um, she's uh, untaught in some of the things of the Spirit. And so she was just sharing with me and my son the other day that when we mentioned fasting, she was like, what? What is fasting? Like, why would they do that? What is that exactly? So it didn't mean anything for her, and it wasn't a truth to her until we showed her in the Word the importance of uh, fasting. These are signs, glimpses, and tastes of what is true for all people in all places at all times. And we simply name the mystery present in all the world, the gospel already announced to every creature under heaven. No, it is not already announced. He holds the entire universe in his embrace. He is within and without time. He is a flesh and blood exposure, exposure of an eternal reality. He is the sacred power present in every dimension of creation. Okay? So, again, we have this all. All of creation. Creation. All. This um, bringing in all face. So it all ends up the same outcome. Okay? So, again, as I said in a previous um, uh, video, that this is a Babylonian mindset. It is a one-world religion. A one-world um, everything ends up the same place type deal. Uh, except for Christianity. Um, that is excluded. Okay, Romans 10, verse 9. 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the de dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Okay, that is in a nutshell how to be born again. Uh, the Lord said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you do not, I will not confess you before my Father. In other words, you have to make a public declaration of your belief in me at some point in your walk. Okay? So, again, we don't want to get caught up in how this occurs. I mean, there are many ways people can be born again. Um, but it involves believing in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confessing him with our mouth as Lord. Okay? So, it doesn't matter so much the how, just that these things must be included in the act of belief. And then you, it says to reduce, uh, or I put in my notes, to reduce uh, salvation to the repetition of a prayer is harmful, but to expand salvation through any way or religion is just as harmful. Okay? And I find it interesting that it's believing in the name of Jesus. Um, you have to believe specifically in Jesus the Christ uh, that that name is indeed con uh, important, contrary to his statement on page 159, where he says, some people use his name, other times they don't. That's not true. Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, it is important that you uh, believe in his name, Jesus as the Messiah. Now, to the final chapter, the good news is better than that. The context of this chapter is the parable of the prodigal son. His explanation is that neither son had a correct view of their father, which is a really cool illustration, actually. Um, the one son, covered in shame for wasting his inheritance, doesn't expect his father to receive him as his son again and is surprised at his father's goodness. The older son views his father as a slave driver, for which he's worked all his life and obeyed his every command, yet his father never gave him a measly goat to enjoy with his friends. The father, however, is willing and has always been good to both sons. Okay, so that, I mean, that's a really good point. I mean, um, both of them had a messed up view of their father. Uh, but then he reduces hell to a party. Okay, so you got the prodigal son that returns. They throw a big party. And he says that we create hell by choosing to believe our story above the father's story. That is Rob Bell's definition of hell. A hell that we create by our choices. But hell is a literal physical place. It is not metaphorical. It's not an ethereal reality we create on earth. It is real. On page 169, he even talks about how some believe heaven is up there, hell is down there, but he states hell is being at the party. That's what makes it so hellish. Again, uh, it really doesn't make a lot of sense, but he uh, points out people that believe they're in two different locations. He states that it isn't an image of separation, but integration. Heaven and hell are within each other ridiculous. Again, they are two separate places, two separate destinations, and their physical locations. He reduces hell to what you believe, not as a real place. Hell is our refusal to trust God's retelling of our story. He states our refusal to accept God's invitation creates what we call hell, again reducing a literal place to a present reality on earth created only by our thoughts. Okay, So once again, we have this gross twisting of scripture uh, out of context that is actually quite stunning. The parable of the prodigal son was a story illustrating Israel as an older brother, legalistic, works-based, God owes them due to the righteousness mentality. The younger son reveals the father's willingness to receive all who come to him in repentance, recognizing their need for his mercy. And that's what the Lord was beginning, a way to be welcomed into the mercy of God. It's a parable revealing the truth about the Father, but showing that Jesus came to save that which was lost. And what was lost? Relationship. Okay? So relationship was lost in the garden, and Jesus came to restore that, which is why it is required to be born again so that you can be restored into relationship with him. The parable was not a doctrine on heaven or hell, as Rob Bell teaches. I do like how, in this chapter, he reveals that there are some who think they are uh, not good enough, and there are some who think that they are good, but both are just as wrong, and that is very true. 
and it misses a crucial point of the entire story of God. It isn't about being good or not. It's all about belief that leads to being born from above with the image of Christ, being a new creation.